All right, so welcome to Space Mission Design with Python. And my name is Helga Eichhorn, and by day I'm a PhD student at Technische Universität Darmstadt, where I do research in uh, model-based engineering and uh, at the Department of Computer Integrated Design. By night, on the other hand, I support the mission analysis section at the European Space Operations Center as an external consultant. And I'm Helgi on GitHub. So the first question is, what is uh, space mission design? So we could also speak about uh, trajectory design. So it is about determining how a spacecraft will reach its target orbit. And that efficiently, in a reasonable amount of time, without violating any engineering constraints, and it should also fulfill all the scientific objectives on the way. So what, what you need to do is you need to model the orbit of the spacecraft and then optimize to find the best possible trajectory. But uh, the point is since, since every scientific space mission and spacecraft are unique and uh, the engineering design is tightly coupled with uh, the mission design, you need to iterate a lot and uh, just so during the development of the mission and you need to be able to answer a lot of questions and that uh, fast. So will there be eclipses? So will the spacecraft enter the, the shadow of the Earth? How hot will it get? Um, how much station keeping? So how much fuel do we need to keep the spacecraft in orbit? And uh, the task is quite computation heavy. So the gold standard has, uh, has been Fortran and MATLAB for visualization. So then, uh, why Python? So at the mission analysis section at the European Space Operations Center, there's a large body of very well-tested Fortran 77 code. And um, of course, as it is usual with Fortran 77, it's very dense and cryptic, and the barrier of entry for newcomers is tremendously high. So um, my fellow trainees and I were swearing a lot. And the other problem with Fortran 77 is that if your only tool is a hammer, every problem starts to look like a nail. And um, I must say Fortran 77 is probably the most beautiful and most awesome sledgehammer in existence. <laughs> you, can, you can do too much with it for your own good. So um, I, I think I'm probably preaching to the choir when I say that uh, if you want to start saving brain cycles instead of CPU cycles, uh, we need better tools and uh, better APIs and better abstractions, um, hence Python. So um, during one very nasty fight with a compiler, I did what every good scientist does when deadlines are looming. I started my very own f uh, open source project, Pleiades, a Python astrodynamics library, which I would like to present to you now. There's the cursor. All right, so what I wanted to do here was uh, to rethink the basic building blocks. So what is the first thing we need to determine the state of a spacecraft? It's a state vector. So um, we have a position vector in three-dimensional space. We have a velocity vector in three-dimensional space. Um, we have the point in time for the, for the state vector, a coordinate frame, and a central body with certain parameters. For example, the uh, gravitational parameter, which is the gravitational constant times the mass of the central body. So what would be the Fortran 77 approach? Well, the first three we dump in a seven element double array. Um, that is, of course, part of the variable name, and this is a common block somewhere. And I am lazy, I don't want to keep that all in my head. So um, what I dis did is I uh, wrote a new state vector class and uh, what we want to do now is uh, do a little analysis so we uh, do some predictions about the orbit of the ISS. So this is the position vector in kilometers, I'm using AstroPy units, which is really nice. Um, unless you run into problems, then it's nasty. And uh, the velocity vector, again, the, a time object from AstroPy, which is also really nice. 
uh, the coordinate frame and uh, the central body, that is the Earth, and now we construct a state object. And pretty print it in the notebook. So there's a lot of stuff here, and so what can we tell about the properties of the orbit from this? Exactly nothing at all. So <laughs> we need uh, some more information. So what uh, the first thing you do to, to determine how the orbit looks like is to uh, calculate the Keplerian or classical orbital elements. So um, we want to describe the shape of the orbital ellipse. For that, we need the semi-major axis and the eccentricity, so how oval the ellipse is. Then um, the, a few angles, and I have a, a picture here. So uh, the inclination, which is the angle between the plane of reference and the orbital plane. Um, the longitude of the ascending node, which is um, the angle between a reference direction and uh, the node line, which, in, which is the intersection of the two planes. So how the orbit is um, located or is uh, rotated towards the reference direction. Then we need to determine um, the orientation of the orbital ellipse within the orbital plane, and that's, and that's the so-called argument of periapsis. And lastly, um, we need to know the position of the orbiting body on the orbital ellipse, and that's the so-called true anomaly. What do we need as inputs? We need the position vector and the velocity vector and the gravitational parameter, and nice, we have all of that. So we can directly calculate it and print it. So we see the eccentricity is close to zero, which means the orbit is almost circular. And um, the inclination is below 180 degrees. That means it's, it's a prograde orbit. So this, uh, the sense of rotational direction is the same as the orbits of the Earth. And we can derive some other quantities from that. So um, the apogee height of the ISS is 414 kilometers right now. And the orbital period is 92 minutes, so um, the ISS circles the Earth in 90 minutes. So now, the next step is we want to predict the orbit uh, sometime in the future. So what we need to do here is some math and uh, solve Kepler's equation. So. Um, We can determine three angles here. So what we're interested in is this one, the true anomaly. So the point at which the spacecraft is uh, on the orbit. And there's two more. There is the mean anomaly, which is uh, the angle at the center of the ellipse, which sweeps the circumcircle. Sounds complicated. I will tell you where, why we need that and uh, the eccentric anom anomaly, which is also at the center and sweeping the orbital ellipse. And the good thing about the mean anomaly is that it's uh, it increases linearly with time. So um, on the ellipse, the other two angles there are, um, so the, uh, the angular velocity is changing. And, um, but with the delta t, we can det uh, directly determine the mean anomaly. And there's a relationship between the true anomaly and the eccentric anomaly. And then there is a relationship between the mean anomaly and the eccentric anomaly, which is Kepler's equation. And uh, now we're screwed, because we can solve that analytically. <coughs> except we're not, because Python to the rescue, we use the uh, newton raphson method from SciPy, and we get a numerical solution. So half an hour into the future, and we get a new state for the ISS. So that's all numbers, and now we want to look at some things. And um, when you do visual visualizations, uh, you spend a lot of time setting up figures and uh, labeling axes and doing that over and over again, and I'm lazy, I don't want to do that. So. Um, it's all in my state vector object, and we get this clumsy visualization. So if anybody knows a better way to do uh, 3D lines and uh, surfaces in Python, <coughs> I'll be um, 
I'm very glad for uh, suggestions. So, uh, but instead, I'll just do a um, projection with in 2D with Bocky, and it looks like this. So, and just to prove that I didn't lie to you, this is the, the new state, and it moved. <laughs> but actually, that's uh, only part of the story, because um, while this is all idealized, uh, Earth is a sphere, and um, in reality, it, it's, not, it's not that easy. So in reality, um, we need to do numerical propagation. So um, what we have here is a Newton's equation, and if you just take this, uh, this gravity term, it's the same as the, uh, the simple Kepler case. But uh, we need to add a lot of other forces, so like third body perturbation, because obviously the moon and the sun and all the other planets, they also attract the spacecraft. Then there's uh, atmospheric drag. Solar radiation pressure is really important. It uh, plays a role. And of course, the non-uniform gravity potential, because the Earth, uh, sadly, is not a sphere. So this is the uh, numerical propagation. And uh, so the blue crosses are the solver steps. And uh, the rest is uh, interpolation. And it's also quite fast, because um, it's calling us uh, a fortune solver underneath in SciPy. <coughs> Ah, okay. So the, the the problem is the dynamics of the system is really high. So you have uh, values. Um, so you have for for the dynamics you have six uh, six equations, and the first three are the values are in the thousands, thousands of kilometers, and. Um, but in the velo velocities, you have single dig digits kilometers per second. So uh, you need the eighth order on the for that. So in, uh, as I said, in reality, the gravity potential of the Earth looks more like this lovely potato. And uh, so we need to refine our force model. And what we do here is we introduce the so-called J2 term and that is, um, takes into account the, the oblatness of the Earth, so that it looks more like an orange. And uh, I really liked uh, the decorator syntax, so I can just uh, write my function here and plug it into the in integrator like this. And uh, now we do 50 revolutions of the ISS. And again, I'm pushing the limits of the visualization. But what we see here is um, that the orbit is not uh, fixed anymore. It's moving. And uh, it looks like it's turning around uh, in, uh, in this direction. So again, if you think back to the, to the orbital elements, Here, the longitude of the ascending node determines the, um, the orientation of the orbital plane. And it seems to move here. So if we plot this element, we see uh, it's decreasing, so as expected. Any questions so far? Uh, why is it expected to decrease? Uh, if, if you do the math, then you, you see it. And uh, of course we saw it. <laughs> <laughs> and of course we saw it in the visualization, so. Where's my cursor? There. Okay, so this was a quick Astrodynamics 101. And 
Now we talk a little about why not Python. So and this is best discussed when we talk about the alternatives. Um, well, <laughs> the, excuse me. <laughs> um, the, the French uh, space agency CNES, they're using Java and there's a lots of uh, vocal proponents for C++, but in my humble opinion, um, if we're talking uh, about compiled languages, then nothing beats modern Fortran. Because um, a matrix multiplication in modern Fortran is just a, a mud mole away and um, it's not as easy to shoot yourself in the foot in, as in Fortran 77 or C++. And um, I really don't want to get started with Java because I don't know how I compile my stuff with Ant, with Maven, with Gradle, with, um, and I need Eclipse to even uh, get the methods. So I'm maybe a bit biased here. But uh, I think the real competitor is Julia. And uh, who of you has, uh, has tried Julia? We need those sticky notes so you can see uh, if, if, if it was a good impression or a bad impression. But um, I think the language is really well designed and uh, gave me good performance. And um, what my main trouble with Python is that there is still, still some kind of a uh, two language problem. So um, if I want to do really high performance stuff, I'll do it in Cython and then um, it's fairly similar, but there's still uh, differences and added complexities. And um, in Julia, it's a more, more linear progression. So I have also stuff there. And uh, finally, some other Python-based astrodynamics projects. So one of those is uh, Polyestro, which is by uh, Juan Luis Cano Rodriguez from the Technical University of Madrid. And uh, he adopted my object model some um, months ago and uh, really ran with it. So if you want to see something full featured, you have to go there. And also some Python C++ stuff, which was uh, developed by the uh, advanced concepts team of, the, of ESA. So thank you very much. Thank you, Helge. Any questions? Thanks for the talk. Have you been able to um, verify your results against uh, any of the old code base? Yes. And does it work? It works. <laughs> <laughs> any more questions? No. Next speaker, please come and connect the laptop. <laughs> 